Hi, I'm Joe Saunders of Miniature Landscape Hobbies, and in this episode, we're going to review the new book by Battlefront Miniatures, Team Yankee, World War III, Warsaw Pact Forces. Right up front, I need to tell my viewers that I'm really excited about this book. You see, Team Yankee is probably my favorite game, and generally I like to play the Communist Forces. So anything that allows me to expand my current army list makes me really, really happy. And if you are into Team Yankee and you're like the same armies I do, you're going to be happy too, because there's a lot of really good stuff in this book. When you crack the book open, or in my case, take a look at the digital copy, you see right from the start all the usual attention to detail and quality that Battlefront puts into all of its books. There's backstory, maps, and plenty of detail to help flesh out for your armies. One thing I noticed here is that I think that there's a little less background material than in most Battlefront's books. This is okay by me, though, because it saves more room for the important part, the army lists. And speaking of army lists, within this book, we get the East Germans, the Czechoslovakian forces, and the Polish. All are somewhat unique, and they largely rely on existing Soviet technology. This doesn't mean that there's not new entries in the book, there's plenty of those. We'll look at each in turn. But first, we better look at what sets each of these countries apart. The first thing you notice is that the Warsaw Pact countries aren't dramatically different in terms of how they're designed and composed from their Russian counterparts. One thing that you will notice, though, is that even though they're hit on threes, they actually all have a better skill rating a skill rating of 4+, plus. where the Russian army usually has a 5+, plus, this is a welcome change. It's supposed to represent the fact that the Warsaw Pact countries have some core elements that are made up of trained troops. Here is an East German BMP mounted rifle company. As you can see, they have a skill of 4+. Plus. They have an Assault of 5, which is typical for Team Yankee, and a counterattack that's decent at 4+. Their Courage is also a respectable 4+, and they have an upgraded morale. These stats go together to make the East Germans a pretty good all-around choice for any type of troop. Now we can compare this exact company to the Czechoslovakians. They're a little different. They have a skill of 4 plus as well, and the same assault, but their counterattack value is 5 plus. They're not going to stick around in assaults as much. Also, notice that the Czechoslovakians are a little bit more of a bargain basement troop because their courage is 5. These aren't the rock solid dependable troops you might want, but their points cost makes up for this. You can also use large quantities of them to make up for the shortcomings. The last nationality are the Polish. These troops are quite a bit different. They've got skill 4 plus again, but they have a counterattack of 3 plus. This makes these troops amongst the best close combat troops for all of the communist forces. You'll also see here that they have a courage of 3 plus. A value this good is not very common in Team Yankee. These guys aren't going to run away anytime soon and should be able to push an attack home. This brings us to the equipment. You won't find any really premium stuff here like T-80s, T-64s, or BMP-3s. This is because the Soviet policy was to save these specialized frontline, highly capable vehicles for themselves. Instead, they exported different, more basic models to their allies. 
and in this case, this manifests as T-72s. Lots of T-72s. All three of the nationalities can take T-72s in their forces in multiple different ways. There are two T-72 variants covered. The first is the T-72M, or modernized. This is just a decent all-around tank. Its armor isn't spectacular, but it's not terrible. Its weapons aren't great, but they're not awful either. They're going to give most vehicles a run for their money, but they probably can't take a punch. This being said, they can come in large units of up to 10, so you can always outnumber your opponent. The other variant is the T-72B. Here we have added ERA and upgraded armor. This is reflected in the stats. With a front armor 18, this vehicle starts to be able to take a punch. The other thing it has is an upgraded anti-tank value because it's got better ammunition in its main gun and it can also fire a missile. This guy might not exactly be on par with the M1 Abrams or the Leopard 2, but it should be able to scare them at least a bit and it can probably obliterate any other tank on the battlefield. Again, this vehicle isn't top tier, but if you take enough of them and use them smartly, you should be able to put the fear into any NATO commander. The rest of the vehicles featured in the book give a unique Warsaw Pact twist on most of the existing Soviet technology, so I'm not going to get into many more specifics. But there are a couple vehicles here that I want to single out for special attention. The first is this one. This is the Su-22 Fitter, a new strike aircraft for Warsaw Pact. I think this plane is great. The USSR doesn't have a lot to choose from in terms of strike aircraft, really just the Su-25 Frogfoot, and it's specifically anti-tank. What the fitter brings to the table is a bit more of a multi-role option. Here you can see options for both salvo and artillery templates, and you can take the regular anti-tank missiles as an upgrade if you want. This should really give you a powerful option that NATO forces won't be able to hide from. Plus, when you combine it with the skill 4 of the Warsaw Pact forces, you're going to get a pretty scary machine for dropping bombs on the enemy. The other thing I wanted to highlight was this, the Dana artillery battery. This vehicle looks great. It's modern and has some amazing capabilities on the battlefield with its 152mm howitzer. Most interestingly here, we have this rule, the autoloader. This gives this vehicle a plus one to hit. When we combine this with the fact that the Warsaw Pact forces have that useful four plus skill again, I think we've got a real winner when it comes to artillery on the table. I would keep a very close eye on this vehicle. I think it's going to become really competitive in Team Yankee moving forward. Beyond these units, you're going to also see some old favorites that you'll want to put on the board, and also some new stuff. Nothing here will be quite as competitive as some of the super tanks that you'll find in other books, but they're all interesting and are going to add some fun options to the game. Because I prefer to use Team Yankee forces from behind the Iron Curtain, I really can't resist speculating how I'll combine the Warsaw Pact book with my own Soviet army. Despite this, I think this book works just as well if you want to use it as a standalone. In this case, I would certainly look at the East Germans. The solid all-round stats would make them a decent contender, 
and with access to the core of good Soviet equipment, they should present a well-rounded force for any player. You might miss the T-80 and T-64 for the heavy hitters, but with enough T-72Bs, I think the East German should still be quite powerful. The Polish units, I figure, would likely be better as an ally formation to Soviet lists. Their upgraded courage and counterattack might go well to lend hard-hitting infantry support where regular Soviet forces struggle. The Czechoslovakians, however, are what I'm interested in, primarily because they're cheap in terms of points. I figure for my Soviet forces, I'll take a Czechoslovakian ally formation and use it to get some artillery. That 4 plus skill just seems too useful. Most Soviet players are used to a rather mediocre 5 plus skill, making the regular inclusion of artillery pretty hit or miss. Pun intended. The Czechs should go a long way to fix this. Although this is what I'm thinking now, like any war gamer, I should reserve the right to change my mind until I get my hands on some of those awesome new models. That's it for this episode. I hope you liked watching it as much as I enjoyed making it. Please remember that Miniature Landscape Hobbies is supported entirely by its viewers. If you would like to assist with the production, please consider joining me on Patreon. I have many levels for my Patreons to subscribe to. You can get access to the STL files I use, and even receive painting lessons or terrain. If Patreon's not your thing, then how about you head over to my Etsy store? Any purchases you might make help support the channel. Thanks for watching, and see you next time. Remember to subscribe, and as always, remember to keep building life in miniature.